generous heart, all that begins right here. The scripture this morning is from Genesis, uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. The Lord has said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree in Moray and Shechem. At that time the Canaanites were in that land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the east and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. The word of the Lord. Well, I'm going to take advantage of this stool since Richard had it up here. If you don't mind, it's still warm. One seat, no waiting. Um, this is a very pivotal passage that we're going to do today. It's the beginning of the journey of journeys, if you will. And so Abraham, which, which means uh, exalted father, by the way. And so anytime you hear that, exalted father. Uh, is beginning his journey here with God. And if you noticed before, if you've ever read this through this passage, you've noticed that God really does not take time to introduce himself. Uh, unlike the situation with Moses where he at least builds in a little bit and he says, this is who I am. And here it's just, go! Go! And what you need to notice or hear in the language there is the imperative command of God. This is not a negotiation. This is not something that you know uh, Abraham is going to get some input on, even if you will. This is a command. Go. And so in Hebrew, it's I can't say this. <laughs> I tried really hard. And so in in, in, in Hebrew, the, the words sometimes they look exactly the same. And so you only you only know from the context of the of the sentence what, what how to say the word. Alright? And so so I don't know if y'all knew this or not. I, I I had a bilingual dog. <laughs> he was he was something special. Let me tell you. So he could understand you in English and Hebrew. And I spoke Hebrew to him a lot because well, okay, I'll, I'll tell you the whole story. This is a sad, sad story. I got this dog, and it was a golden retriever. And she was beautiful. And the kids named her Angel. Because she really was. And all she wanted to do was be with you. Okay? That's all she wanted. Just be with you. She'd come over and lay by you. And that's all she wanted. So you pet her well, and you say, okay, that's okay, go and everything was fine. And then we had to do this. We had to get a second call. <laughs> and he was a black lab, which you think, okay. But the kids named him Demon. <laughs> and did he live up to his name or what? You know, we're in Garden City this past week and we just replaced all the spindles on our porch because he chewed them off like a gopher. <laughs> And the fence that we had between our neighbors was chewed. I mean, he chewed the whole fence up and walked right through to the neighbor's yard. I mean, what kind of dog is this? And so the same thing kind of applied around when he came in for the time of night at the house, is the dog would go nuts. He'd come in and he just couldn't lay down. I mean, that's all you wanted. And he was just like, hey, how do you go? How do you go? I gotta go over here. And then, you know, I'm going over here. I don't know why I'm over here. And he was just going crazy. And so, so I had to teach this dog to lay down. 
lay down. And English just, you know, lay down. I just couldn't make it forceful enough. And so I thought, all right, we're stepping up the Hebrew on this. <laughs> and so in Hebrew, if you want to say lay down, so like every time I see Teresa, it's Shekhar. Shekhar, come here. Let's cut it. Shekhar. But for Demon, it's Shaba. <laughs> now it's the exact same word. It means lay down. But it's in the imperative. And you can understand there's no wiggle room on this. <laughs> and so Demon actually got to the point where he understood this was no longer a debate. It was Shaba, get down. And he did it. Well, this is the language that God used on Abraham. It sounds rather rough, and it really should come across that way. God is not entering into a debate, and God is not trying to share some you know, time of discussion with Abraham. He's telling him, you go. Go. Now notice Abraham uh, immediately. You notice how quickly he left. Just immediately. It's one of the characteristics you see oftentimes in the Bible scriptures. Are the great heroes of the Bible are those whose blind obedience to God results in just immediate action. It's not enough to just simply say, I believe in God. But you have to believe in God and show it through your actions. If you can pull off that second part, then you have accomplished what God is trying to get you to Radical obedience followed by action. Now, Abraham and his faith, and remember the Bible faith of Abraham is legendary, right? Everybody knows that Abraham had incredible faith. Was shown in this story that Steve just read. The third, first three verses of this passage are considered the linchpin not only of the rest of Genesis, but in the whole Old Testament. This is why the story was written. These three verses. You go, and I will make you a great nation. With blind obedience, radical obedience, and the struggle throughout the Old Testament from there on out where we just couldn't quite follow God as well as we well as well as Eno. And so that was the challenge and that's the struggle throughout the Old Testament. This passage just plays out immediately. But let's talk about this passage because Abraham did immediately go, right? And not only did he immediately go, when he walked into Canaan, now remember, who's he walking in with? Not very many people. We'll, we'll talk about how many people he has some other time in life, but he walks in with his family into a foreign land surrounded by a whole bunch of strange folks and God says, this is where I'm going to make you into a great nation. And what does Abraham do? Right in the middle of all these strangers, right in the middle of all this land he had never been at, he heaps up, he builds up an altar and he sacrifices to God there. Now, I had a crop, and I wasn't, I, 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 I was afraid I might get lynched, so I didn't bring it. <laughs> or I forgot. You decide whichever. <laughs> and uh, I was at this point, it would be something like this. And I was going to unfurl a huge Chiefs banner, Kansas City Chiefs banner, <laughs> right here. I had just come into this foreign land, and I just, Boom! <laughs> Praise the Lord, we all teach fans now. I wonder how that would have went. <laughs> Not well. Maybe I'm glad we left that back in Kansas. <laughs> but can you, the radical of Abraham's move there, that's, that is just that bold. And remember, he's heaping up this little altar. I mean, it's not huge. It's not. A, it's just a pile of rocks. I mean, that's really what it is—a pile of rocks with all these temples, the other gods, all around him. And he's done this as a statement of him claiming 
what God has said. So you think, again, the faith of Abraham, incredible, powerful, unwavering. And then he goes to Egypt. And in one of his very first acts as a follower of God, he convinces his wife to act like his sister. And in fact, the wife goes off to live with Pharaoh for a little bit. Because, you know, for an 80-year-old woman, she's hot. Okay? <laughs> so, you know, Pharaoh pulled her in. So, yeah, something doesn't seem right in this story. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but, you know, hey, whatever. And so, so Pharaoh goes living with her and finds out, wait a minute, this is your wife. What are you doing to me? So faith is a tricky thing. Some days we can be as confident as Abraham to build up an altar right in the middle of all our enemies. And other days, we're so hesitant to tell the truth. We lie. It's a journey we all walk. Abraham showed us in these chapters in these verses, that faith is not something that's simply unwavering in a straight line. But instead, faith is something we work out with fear and trembling as we journey towards a direction. And the true faith of the journey is we never give up. See, Abraham could have given up, right? After that kind of debacle, for lack of a better word, in Egypt. He could have went, oh, man, I can't do this. Or God could have given up on him and said, boy, did I pick wrong. But neither happens. Neither happened. And instead, that journey of faith continued, again, with Abraham sometimes doing incredibly great things and sometimes doing some stuff you go, really? You did it again with the Philistine king? I mean, did you learn no lesson from before? Of course, you know, he did walk out of Egypt with a whole bunch of money because Pharaoh was scared and gave him a whole bunch of money. But anyway, and so this is the journey we walk back and forth. That's our journey of faith. Now, one of the things in this story that I find really cool, <coughs> Abraham built that altar knowing full well he would never see the realization of it. He knew that he would never see this place become a great nation. He knew that was going to be for his kids, 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 kids. And so Abraham in building that altar did something that he knew probably wouldn't benefit him as much as future generations. Isn't that the story of us? Isn't that what we do? The decisions we make today, the actions we do today, will have an incredible impact and consequence on that next generation. We as a church have to make difficult decisions. And some of those decisions, honestly, we're never going to see the blessing. But our generations that are coming after us will. And so we have to be faithful and say, God is faithful. And He will not leave Himself without a voice. He will not leave Himself without a witness. He will not leave Himself without a church. And so we must faithfully do the very best we can do to prepare this place for the next generation. Amen. Not our generation. The next. Now, why must we do that? Well, folks, you are sitting here today because of incredible people that did incredible things a few years ago. Amen. Amen. They sacrificed and they gave so that you can have this place. And that is exactly what we need to do ourselves, is begin to talk about what sacrifice and change and things we must do differently so that we can prepare that next generation for those very great blessings that we feel every time we're here. It is a blessing to be in this place. I hope you feel that.
It is for me. I missed you all last week. I really did. And so it's fun to be back again. So let's try to remember on Memorial Day what a great lesson, what a great message is to remember that sometimes we make decisions and we do things not for our benefit, but for those who come. God bless y'all. Real good. Amen.